This is what Thomas Jefferson saw from Monticello. The view as perfect as his high ideals. Well, I'd like to welcome you to our Slavery at Monticello tour. But at Monticello today, it is the imperfect Jefferson we see. Monticello was a plantation. And must judge for ourselves. Jefferson professed to hate slavery, called it an abominable crime, but he held on to his slaves. He freed only seven. The author of the Declaration of Independence, who wrote that all men are created equal, owned 600 slaves over his lifetime. And in addition to his legitimate children, almost certainly fathered at least six other children with his slave, Sally Hemings. For generations, descendants of Sally Hemings have been telling stories implicating Jefferson as father of her children. DNA proof of a connection came in 1998. Is Thomas Jefferson any less great because the understanding we have of him now is three-dimensional? Most human beings I know are quite capable of denial and hypocrisy. And I think that Jefferson's virtues were enormous and his vices were equally enormous. Pulitzer Prize-winning author John Meacham has just published a best-selling new biography of our third president. Looked at in full, you find a man whose life was made possible by slavery, who had misgivings, who as a young man attempted, however feebly, to reform the institution. But in the end, he was ultimately someone who was trapped by, allowed himself to be trapped by the economic, political, and cultural circumstances into which he was born. Uh, Jefferson said that his earliest memory was of being handed up on a pillow as a toddler to a slave on a horse. And we know that his last words were asking Burl Colbert to adjust his pillow here in this room. Jefferson's butler, Burl Colbert, was also a slave. There would have been an intimate relationship really from, from birth to death. Elizabeth Chu is curator at Monticello. Now, are there pieces of furniture in this room that were made by slaves? Yes. Um, in the, the joinery or the furniture-making wood shop um, in um, Jefferson's later years was run by a slave named John Hemings. And Hemings ran the joinery and made many pieces of furniture that are in Monticello today. This is an example. He was very highly skilled. And he was uh, freed by Jefferson in his will and given the tools of his trade. John Hemings is remembered because of his craftsmanship, unlike so many other Jefferson slaves. To be able to sort of have an image of Jefferson that we all know, and behind him, the names of the 600 people that he owned in his lifetime, really means that we have to understand slavery in order to understand Jefferson. Lonnie Bunch heads the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture, sponsor of a traveling exhibition about slavery at Monticello. And what's powerful is, quite candidly, we only know the first names. And there are some that we just have as unknown because we don't even Lucy, know. Lucy, right. Lucy, 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 right. where it's almost any old name. That's exactly right. This is Thomas Jefferson's laptop desk. This is the desk upon which he wrote early drafts of the Declaration of Independence. The first of those drafts attacked Britain's slave trade. Jefferson writing that King George III has waged cruel war against human nature itself. The Continental Congress took the phrase out. Alongside the rejected passage, the financial reality next to it is his farm book and here is where he would list the births and deaths of the slaves he would list the work that they did so in some ways it really gives us a full picture of the totality of Jefferson which at times contradicts the popular image of Jefferson as a benevolent slaveholder the nail reoccupied one half of this site. Inside, there were four forges. One example, what went side. on at Jefferson's extremely profitable nail-making workshop at Monticello. As a young child, your job was to move the nails around, but by the time you're 12, 13, 14, your job is to make these nails. The boys were routinely whipped to force them to be more productive. That happened while Jefferson was on Monticello. It happened when he was gone because in the 18th century, you couldn't run a plantation without using violence. 
A man of his time, Jefferson thought he was benevolent, but even his plan for ending slavery would be considered racist today. His view was that at best there could be an emancipation, but then there would be repatriation, there would be colonization. African American slaves would leave the United States. He did not foresee a biracial integrated society, one of the many ironies of his life.